because we're not all happy all the time, right? Um, but certainly, you know, happiness to me is is uh, the first cup of coffee sitting on the deck with my wife early in the morning, you know? Um, happiness is sitting here with this little one. You do not have to deal with and stick with and stick out burnout and unhappiness in the medical profession. This is what we are talking about today with ER physician and podcast host, Dr. Andrew Tisser. He shares with us today in this episode his own journey of getting into the medical profession and finding out that he was miserable and how he pivoted and took a left turn to find happiness and fulfillment in his career. We talk a lot about early career physicians and what sometimes when you find out that maybe you've made the wrong decision and what to do with the financial burden of medicine, dentistry, and pharmacy. And when you wake up one day and think, wow, this really isn't for me. We also talk about different options, what he sees in his clients and in the people he interviews on his podcast as being the biggest obstacles to changing your career path or maybe thinking outside the box. I know you're going to love this one, especially because Andrew, the entire interview is bouncing his four-month-old on his knee, which is such a beautiful example of today's modern-day family in medicine. I know that you're going to love this conversation, and if you have been struggling with burnout or unhappiness in the medical profession in any way, this is definitely an episode for you to hear. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Tisser. Hello and welcome to the Business of Happiness podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Taryn McCarthy, and today we have with us Dr. Andrew Tisser. Welcome so much to the podcast today, Andrew. We're so happy to have you. Hey, Taryn. Thanks so much for inviting me. Awesome. I am so eager to be sharing this conversation with my audience today because I love your platform on Talk To Me Doc, your podcast that you have, and specifically focusing on the early career physician and bringing some great support to early career physician, what I'd love for you to do is just tell us a little bit about how you came to that journey through your experience in medicine and how you started this podcast and the purpose behind the podcast. Sure, absolutely. So uh, for listeners out there, if you hear any babbling, I got my four month old here with me. So uh, do excuse that. But uh, <laughs> which we love, by the way, that's awesome. Hey, it's part of happiness, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so basically, my short story is that um, I'm uh, an emergency physician by training. Um, I pretty much was pretty burnt out and dissatisfied all along my medical journey. I I know a lot of people like get through, go through medical school and then residency and then get out and practice for 10, 15 years. And then they realize they hate it. I kind of hated it from the beginning, to be honest. Mm. Um, Right around second year of medical school, uh, I was unsure that this was the correct path for me. Uh, however, at that point I was really too indebted to stop, um, in my mind, at least now I know that that's not really true, but, um, and the, the thing of it is the advice I got from everyone was that it'll get better. Um, you're just miserable cause you're a medical student. And I was like, well, okay. And then, <laughs> uh, I moved on to clinical rotations in our third and fourth year, um, Still wasn't too super enthralled by any of it, to be honest. And um, well, just wait till uh, till you're a resident and and you're a real doctor, then then I get better. Um, So I decided on emergency medicine because that was the field that I disliked the the least, (laughs) for lack of lack of a better term. And um, and I started residency. And and for those of the listeners that that don't know, uh, medical residency is is really. kind of uniformly a miserable experience, Mm. um, for everyone, some worse than others. So uh, I was in residency and I was miserable in fact. And, uh, my, the faculty members said, well, you're resident, of course, of course it sucks. Right. Mm. And, uh, it'll get better once you're out there making the big bucks and, and, and you're ready, you know? So I got done with training, ready to be, um, satisfied and happy with my decision. And in fact, I was not once again. So I, um, I worked at multiple different facilities, little tiny hospitals, giant academic medical centers. I worked everywhere trying to find a place that I would, that I would enjoy. Um, and I I didn't really like it anywhere, so to speak. So, uh, so I started kind of this quest, um, to, to find my exit plan. Um, I was like, well, this is terrible. So I got to do something else. 
And my wife does not look fondly back on these days because on, you know, I joke on Monday, I was going to do like Botox. And then on Tuesday, I was going to be in the pharmaceutical industry. And then on Wednesday, I was going to work for the insurance company, you know, and it was anything I could do uh, to replace my income because of course, we also had a half a million dollars of student loan debt to deal with. Um, that wasn't this, right? And and it was kind of a, a pretty bad place in my life. So the conversation I had with my wife was, well, we were we were living in Chicago at the time. We're gonna stay here temporarily. When we move back to our forever home, then you can figure out your quest, mm. right? I said, okay. Um, and, and I took some time to get to know myself. Then, uh, I started working on some personal development work. I worked with some of my own mentors and coaches to figure out like what I wanted to do and what was important to me. And then, uh, when we went, moved here to Buffalo, New York, um, I went after it and got it. And so, uh, and the fun thing about it all is that I'm still practicing clinically, never left medicine, uh, very happy in my current situation. And, uh, and it all works out in the end. Right. Um, on the podcast front, it, originally I decided to make a podcast about medical communication and how we interact with the other team members, um, just because I was interested in that. And, uh, that evolved over time because, it, you know, Terry, it got kind of stale. Um, yeah. cause everyone was saying the same thing, right? Everyone has a voice. Everyone is part of the team. Um, this whole hierarchical system in medicine really shouldn't exist. And I agree with all those sentiments, but like to hear it week in, week out got kind of boring, you know? Um, so, and as that was getting more boring, uh, my interest in the early, the struggles of the early career physician, um, started, mm. you know, improving. So I, uh, I decided to pivot the show. Um, that was right around June of 2020. It was ju just about a year ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I pivoted the show then, and that's what I've been talking about since. And, uh, that's a really long answer to a really short question, but that's where I'm at right now. So what is it that you discovered in your personal search? What did you find out about yourself that you really needed to hone in on and focus on to bring you more self and inner fulfillment? So the question is always, I, you know, the question becomes, what do you want, right? Like, what do you want to do with your career? Um, and I, I don't think I I'm, I'm not of the mind that you can separate career and life. I, I don't think it's possible. I know it's like a nice ideal, but I don't think it's possible. Right. So if you're miserable at work, you're going to bring that home yeah. always. Right. And, and it was affecting my relationship with my wife. It was affecting my relationship with my friends because it was miserable all the time. Right. Mm. Um, so what I, uh, and then the question becomes, okay, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I don't know anything but this. Right. And, and a lot of the people I work with now tell me the same thing. Well, I don't want to do this. I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to do? I don't know. Not this. Um, that's not helpful at all. Right. Cause when you're, you always need to be running towards something, not away. Right. So if you're running away from something, uh, you're not starting in a good position. So, it, you know, I, I talk through my process basically in stages. There's like the, the inside work, the inner work, right. The kind of hokey stuff people want to say, even though it's not that hokey. Um, then, so there's the why, the what, and the how, right. So the why is figuring out who you are as a person, what your values are, what your belief system is and what makes you happy. Right. Like you talk about, um, the, the middle portion of it is the, what, what, well, what specifically am I going to do? And, uh, you know, I help people figure that out. Just doing experiments We're we're met, you know, you're, a medical person. I'm a medical person. We're scientists. So why do we not treat our careers as a science experiment? Why do we not develop hypotheses and then go out and test them? Um, because let's say, for example, I decided I was going to go work for the insurance company, whatever. Um, and I knew nothing about working for the insurance company, except it was a nine to five and pretty good pay. Uh, you might get there after like going through the interview process and transitioning and realizing you're just as miserable there um, because perhaps it is, it's disparate with your, with your core values and who you are as a person. Um, and so what I learned about myself um, over time was what, what am I good at? Right. Cause I, I mm. teach people to use strength based personal development. I, I don't believe in, making your weaknesses better, which is nice. You know, it's a good thing to do, but as far as careers, a con career is concerned, I don't believe in improving your weaknesses. I believe in having a career that's based on your strengths. Um, and we all have unique abilities and strengths. Uh, so I figured out what my strengths were, who I was as a person, what I cared about. And that allowed me to kind of strategize and figure out what I wanted out of this life. 
So what are your strengths? What is your superpower? Well, I can, uh, you know, uh, lift a building with one finger and uh, <laughs> all, all, all this, all the <laughs> Superman things, right? Um, so, so I'm analytical. Let me tell you what you can do. You can rock a baby while you're, <laughs> while you're doing a podcast interview. And I am impressed, Andrew. Well, I'm trying. You, you know, are like... crushing it. You are doing it. So I apologize. Go back. Tell me, what is it you discovered that is your talent? So I am very good with people. Um, my communication skills are, are very, you know, I hate to, it's, it's always one of those things. Like when we start talking about ourselves, we get like all uh, like anxious and nervous, but, yeah. um, so I, I love talking to people. My wife says that like, it drives her nuts. Cause I, I I'm the guy who talks to the person on the plane next to them. Unfortunately, I just, <laughs> I love it. Um, so I, but, but the thing is, I love hearing people's stories and learning mm. about them. Right. And, and when it comes to careers, that is networking, right? So when I, when I try to teach people about networking, it's not what can Taryn do for me to get me a job. It's who is Taryn? What does mm. she stand for? Mm. What, what, you know, what makes her tick, right? What is her story? Um, and then perhaps down the line, once we have a targeted, meaningful relationship, there may be something when it comes to career out of it. But if you go into each conversation, trying to think about what the other person is going to do for you, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to have a meaningful relationship because people throw, people throw around the word networking all the time. Networking is useless. All right. Like if you have 20,000 LinkedIn connections and you don't know any of them, who cares? Right. Mm. Uh, that's not going to help you get a job. Um, it's targeted relationship building. Um, that's, that's what true, you know, quote networking is. Um, so that's one of my, my natural skills, uh, which, which kind of helps me on the other part of the thing is that I, I like numbers. I'm analytical in general. I like being in the boardroom, talking to people in a meeting. I like looking at the spreadsheets and I know that's like, like death for some people, but I enjoy that. Um, and I like the finance side of medicine as well. So looking at those things, uh, a role in, in administration uh, would make sense, right? Um, because you can affect a lot more people by, um, be, by making effective change, yeah. by, by forming relationships, and by being able to use uh, metric-based parameters in order to make effective change. Now, so for some people, that might be the worst job in the absolute world, right? I, I couldn't stand being in a meeting. I couldn't stand mm -hmm. looking at a profit and loss statement, right? Mm -hmm. That that could be you. Um, but uh, so those are some of my strengths. And additionally, the, additionally, addition, and uh, in addition, the uh, the relationship building, the communication aspect of things, um, coupled with every doctor's wish to help people you know, really helped me lead me to my career strategy business as well. So do you think that people who are unhappy specifically in the medical professions have gotten to that place because they haven't taken the time to ask themselves what is important to them and what their talents are and their passions are? Do you think that they've gone in this direction because they've just been putting one foot in front of the other and maybe been negligent of asking themselves those deeper questions? Maybe. Um, some people just made a bad decision, right? Um, some mm. people got bad advice. Um, you know, some people went into medicine because doc, because daddy and mommy wanted them to go into medicine. Hmm. Um, and, or some people thought you'd make a really good salary, you know, like there's a lot of bad reasons to go into medicine. So there's some, there's that group of people. There's a the group of people that were idealists and disillusioned with what medicine entails. Right. So some people just didn't know what it was like, uh, which comes back to experiments, which is what I have people do all the time. But mm. so some people were just didn't know what the realities of modern medicine are. Some people are just have a bad job, right? Some people mm. have a really bad employer. Some people work for a bad system. Sometimes the best job is right down the street, right? Um, and so, you know, that's, that's part of it as well. But there also are unique stressors to, to in modern medicine, you know, COVID notwithstanding, that's a whole different discussion. But uh, I think, that are different than the, the physicians and dentists and pharmacists of, of prior years. Um, this current generation has uh, an absurdly higher student loan debt uh, balance, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, they also have more documentation. Uh, they have higher administrative burdens as well. 
um, especially as the healthcare industry has fully morphed into a customer service industry, right? Um, so the there's a lot of of external forces, but there are also a lot of internal issues as well. So I I like to tell people I I don't want anybody to leave medicine, like because I need people to take care of me. So I like please stay in medicine. Um, uh, but if that's what's right for you, like let's do that as well. But the question, the first question when we're looking at what you're going to do is whether or not you're going to stay clinical or not. Um, Cause a lot of people come to me just saying they're done and oftentimes mm. they stay, um, mm. but in just a different way. If you're listening to this podcast, chances are you didn't get into business to be miserable. The problem is that people feel that if their business gets busier, if they start becoming more successful, that happiness will eventually set in, but it can actually get worse. This is why I created the Business of Happiness Prosperity Coaching. In this one-on-one -on -one coaching, we look at how to redefine success on your terms and refine the joy and the passion in your dream. Visit me at thebizofhappiness.com and become the happiest business owner you know. Yeah, and there's so many other facets of medicine, like academia, you know, where you're not actually entrenched in clinical practice, but such a valuable part of what keeps us going forward and learning and challenging one another is having really brilliant minds in academia. So I think that from my perspective, at least medicine and dentistry and pharmacy, there's so many other avenues. It's such a plethora of options. But perhaps that question is just where do you belong and what do you want out of it? What brings you that fulfillment? Absolutely. You know, yeah. and, and a lot of people um, get really upset when, when perhaps they realize what's better for them is working for an insurance company or yeah. is, uh, you know, is doing clinical research in, instead of seeing patients, you know? Um, and I think a lot of it comes down to sunk costs and the sunk cost fallacy um, such that I've spent all this time in my, sorry, you're okay. Pause. Yep. All right, baby. You're okay. There we go. Welcome. Welcome, baby. <laughs> I have to say it. Hello, sweetheart. Who is this? <laughs> this is Marlo. Marlo has the most beautiful eyes, Andrew. Thank I have you. to say okay, it is, grab cords, though. it is a really beautiful thing to see a father in medicine, here with his kid. I know you mentioned your wife's in medicine as well, am I right? Yeah. So this is the modern day family. This is what we're looking at. This is what, and it's it's so important, I think, for all of us to recognize that we all have these challenges. So I'm so glad Marlo's joining us today because this is a part of it as well, is this constant tugging at your soul when you're not happy at work and then feeling so guilty because you have Marlo at home and you're thinking, I'm spending eight hours a day, 12 hours a day sometimes doing something I hate and Marlo needs me at home. Yeah, exactly. And all the pressures, you know, that that, that are on everyone nowadays to to produce at work when uh, especially, you know, I hate to say it, but technically I am a millennial, uh, but the millennial generation um, wants to be home right? Who wants to be home with their kids and family. But um, I don't remember what I was talking about. Oh, yeah, the sunk cost fallacy. So yes. I, I've spent so much time and money to become a doctor, pharmacist, yeah. dentist, whatever it may be. If I can't give it up now, I've wasted all that, right? But uh, sunk cost in, in economics is all right. Well, if you have to give it, if, if you don't give it up, then you're just continually putting money into something that is, is not going to give you any return. Um, so this, this is a fallacy because, um, what does that have to do with the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life? Right. Um, so yes, you've spent all this time to become a doctor. It will always be part of your identity. Um, but perhaps you're going to be an insurance doctor or a pharmaceutical mm -hmm. doctor or, an academic, like you said, or, or whatever. Um, so people struggle with that. Uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, perhaps you would be better suited in that position. Perhaps you can help more people that way, um, as opposed to being a burnt out cardiologist who hates going to the office every day. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're the person, you know, designing the next clinical trial to you know, combat heart disease or whatever it may be. Right. Um, so there are so there are an endless amount of possibilities of what you can do with your career 
having a medical background, all these degrees are highly marketable um, from, you know, going from small businesses, going from uh, solo adventures, from startups to big giant corporations, people need medical people to advise them. Um, we see many, many more companies having chief medical officers that we never, we never saw in the past. So uh, there's really, there's an endless amount of possibilities. So you just have to be willing to know what you want and then go get it. What do you think it is that holds people back? I mean, intellectually, we all know this to be true. There's so many options. You can even be on TV talking about medicine and never touch another patient again and be a, a you know, a famous actor at all about medicine. Mm -hmm. How do we, what is it that holds us back from pivoting in that way? What do you think it is? What's the common theme among the people you speak to who are just too afraid to see things differently or think outside the box and think they have to just lay in the bed that they made? Sure. I, I love that you said think outside the box. So I had this a video series um, on Friday. It's called Healthcare Career Strategy Bites. And the first two months ago, we discussed common mental barriers when it comes to career change. And last month, we discussed how to start thinking outside the box. And so sunk cost is a big one that we already talked about. Another one is fear of failure. So uh, we're, 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 it's ingrained in us that if we make a mistake, if we, if we do anything wrong, that a patient could get hurt or die, right? So we, we become these perfectionists um, and we want everything checked off before we make any decisions, before we take one step, because we're so afraid that we'll screw it up, um, even though nothing's going to happen. If I made a mistake in my marketing for my business, nothing happens. I lost a couple bucks and maybe some hours. Um, it's the same thing when it comes to careers, right? Nothing bad is going to happen. If you make the mistake, then you just start over. Um, and so a lot of the people that come to me want to know what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, who they're going to work for, how much money they're going to make. And they want it all lined up before they will even send one email. Right. Yeah. And that's just, that's not how the world works. Right. Um, so, so that's, you know, fear of failure, some cost fallacy. Sorry. Um, those are, those are big ones. Um, another one is just, uh, you think I hear this all the time. I have no marketable skills. Oh God. You know, that drives me insane. How do you not have any marketable skills? You're one of the high, mo most highly educated, best trained people in the workforce, in the American workforce, and you don't have any marketable skills. That's crazy to me. Um, physicians are naturally leaders. Uh, they use team dynamics. Uh, they know how to communicate some of them. Um, <laughs> the, you know, there's, there's so many things you have and, and you have a, a very, very unique skill set that people want um, and people want to pay you for. Right? So do you think that's lack of self-worth? Is that because oh, yeah, so many times big. we get beaten down in residencies and we mm -hmm. get broken down in so many ways? Do you think sometimes people lose that confidence in themselves? Absolutely. I think so. I mean, I think the medical training establishment is again, a whole nother discussion for another day because that's broken. But mm -hmm. um certainly there's a lack of self-worth. Um, you know, we hear it all the time. Well, know your worth, know your worth. And then people get their first job offer and they're like, sure, I'll take it. Um, without any, any thought to negotiation at all. Um, mm -hmm. so, so certainly that's part of it. I mean, there's, there's, you know, I think some of it's lack of exposure, you know, I, there's, there's the three top jobs for, for, for doctors, non-clinical jobs. And then one of them's chart review, which basically you go, you work for some insurance company or, or some independent agency and you look at charts and you report on stuff. Um, so that's a big one. And, and let me, and let me interrupt you for a second. When you say top jobs, you mean as far as income is concerned? No, I, I think the ones that come to mind when people ask, oh, okay. well, what could I do non-clinically? Okay. So that one comes to mind. There's a lot of competition for that because generally it's remote pays pretty well. Um, and there's no weekends, no holidays kind of thing. Um, there's medical writing, you know, either writing all kinds of different medical writing and there's the pharmaceutical industry. And then if you don't want to do one of those three things, people are like, well, nothing else I could do. Um, and that's absolutely untrue. So, you know, lack of exposure is certainly another big one, but you know, people are just, people are afraid. Um, and, and, 
they've, they know what they know and they don't think they could do anything else. And, and they, all they know, and, and then people get their identity wrapped up in being a physician. Right. So like when people ask you, uh, you know, what do you like, Hey, what do you do? And people are like, Oh, uh, you know, I'm a doctor. Um, and that's it. Right. Like, Mm. no, that is one portion of your identity. Um, you know, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a podcaster. I am, I am an ER doctor. I, you know, I like to take care of my rose garden. I like to, you know, listen to music. I like to try new foods, whatever, you know, there's so much, so many parts of your identity that aren't just being a physician. So you're not losing your identity as a physician or pharmacist or dentist. When you take on a new role, you're adding to it. Mm -hmm. Um, So now perhaps you are a physician who also, um, you know, has courses on low carb nutrition or whatever you Mm -hmm. end up wanting to do. Um, so I don't even remember what the question was, but <laughs> that's where we're at. No, you answered it beautifully, just in terms of what is holding people back from pivoting and from taking on new things. And, you know, I have a, a theory, and I wonder how what you think about this, just because of your experience having spoken to so many people. And one of my theories is that success, a certain level of success or achievement actually can sometimes hold us back from trying something new. So we have this feeling that, all right, I've succeeded here in this regard. Now I'm called doctor. I can't possibly be a novice all over again. It's that fear of starting something from scratch again and starting kind of it on the lowest level of the totem pole once you've already achieved a certain level of success. What do you think about that as a, in terms of holding people back? For sure. I mean, yeah. definitely, I, you know, and the, it's also like, you oftentimes you, if you do transition your industry, you have to learn so many new things. Mm. Right. Um, like I just started my role as a medical direct ER medical director, and I have to learn all kinds of new things I didn't know about before, but like, it's exciting to me, Mm. um, because it's what I wanted to do. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, certainly people are afraid of, of learning these new things, but like, we're all like super intelligent, highly motivated people. So it's going to be easy. Right. Um, especially people I talk to that want to start their own businesses. I'm like, business is not hard. Like, you know, being a, whatever, a cardiologist is really hard. Um, figure, you know, figuring out how you're going to run the books is not going to be difficult. Um, so, you know, so certainly that is, that is a big part of it. And, you know, I, I know someone, uh, who quit medicine completely to, to be a real estate agent. Cause she just loved it. Mm. Like she loves that. And she's making double what she was making as, as a pediatrician in real estate right now. Um, and if she never took that leap right. uh, and she started on the side, she didn't go cold Turkey and just jump in, you know, which you could do, but she didn't quit her job, but eventually she did. Um, so there's just, there's so much you can do, whether it's peripherally related to medicine or whether it's something totally different. There's a lady I know, um, an OBGYN who, uh, loved cars, like cars were, were her vice. And she walked into a car dealership one day and was like, Hey, do you need a new salesman? And now she <laughs> works out. She sells cars. She's like their, their best producer makes wow. unbelievable amounts of money because she's selling all kinds of fancy cars. Um, and that was just her passion in life. You know, yeah, just listening to that inner voice, telling her where her passions lie. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So one thing you mentioned at the, at the top of the hour was how when you're unhappy at work, you bring that unhappiness home with you. And I believe the same is wholly true when your personal life is falling apart. It's very hard to bring your whole self to be your best person in your career. Mm -hmm. What does happiness mean to you? What does happiness mean to me? I mean, you know, I think... I think happiness is, is another, is another emotion, uh, and part of the, as part of the gamut of them all. Right. Like, I think this, this focus on like not feeling the bad emotions these days too. Um, cause we're not all happy all the time. Right. Um, but certainly, you know, happiness to me is, is, uh, the first cup of coffee sitting on the deck with my wife early in the morning, you know, um, happiness is sitting here with this little one. Um, talking to you, you know, talking about things I love, right. Um, and making a difference in people's lives. So, so it's, uh, it, happiness is multifaceted and, and changes throughout the day, throughout the year and throughout your lifetime. Um, but I think when you're, when your values and your belief systems are aligned with the things that you are doing, um, then that naturally leads to more happiness than the alternative, not 
happiness constantly, um, but certainly more happiness than the alternative. So, uh, you know, the little things, I'm not a stuff person, but it, it's uh, experiences are, are, are do it for me, but, um, you know, certain, certain things like that are, is really all I want. You know, one of my core values, sorry, Marlo, um, one of our call, one of my core values is family. Uh, family is most important to me, um, no matter what. Um, and, Certainly, I you know, I didn't have a lot of family growing up, and and didn't have I had somewhat of a contentious relationship with my parents. So, um, family is everything to me, and so whatever it takes for them um, mm. is really is really what makes me happy. Being able to to give them the life that that they deserve uh, is what makes me happy. That's awesome. Well, you're exemplifying that in real time for us right here <laughs> with Marlo in your lap, Andrew. So before I ask you your, our last question here, I wanted to just give you the opportunity to let my audience know how they can find you and learn more about you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. So my website ho- kind of houses the, is the mothership, right? It's uh, andrewtisserdo.com. Um, and uh, there's a few things there. Well, there's a link to my podcast. Um, there's also uh, a free video series that kind of describe my journey, um, through medical school residency, early attending hood and beyond, and has embedded, um, career strategy tips in each video. Uh, those are, and then I'm on all social networks. I'm most, I'm most active on LinkedIn, which is just my name and, um, and Instagram at, which would be talk to me doc LLC. So I'll give you all the links for everything, but uh, yeah, you know, please, please reach out and find me if you need something. Um, I work with all healthcare, early career healthcare workers in general. Uh, my specialty is physicians, but I've now worked with, I think, pretty much every one of them. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Wonderful. And we'll put all those links in the show notes, of course. And please check out Andrew's podcast, Talk To Me Doc. It's excellent. It's got the number two in it, Talk mm-hmm. To Me Doc. And as we close out our conversation here today. Andrew, if you could leave us with just a last final 30 second statement of advice that you would give to early career physicians, dentists, and pharmacists, what would be your greatest lesson or advice that you could give to offer them an option or offer them an opportunity or promise of finding fulfillment and happiness in their career? Sure. So my advice is always that you have options. You have a multitude of options. There is a no, there is no reason to continue to stay in a career that you despise. They may be able to restructure it. You may be able, you may have to leave it completely, but there's no reason to be unhappy when you're early in your career and you have your whole career ahead of you to do things with it. So don't be unhappy. You have millions of options. And if you need help, I'm here. Fabulous. Thank you so much. And thank you for all that you do, Andrew. And thank you, Marlo, for joining us today. (laughs) So great to see you. And (laughs) please, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. And please check out Talk To Me Doc Podcast and look up Andrew online. Thank you again. Thank you. 